one of the things about uh, doing what I get to do, like I, I get to walk with people in ministry and get to help them out and get to, to see them with their joy. I get to watch as people um, have struggles. I get to see them overcome struggles. But one of the things uh, that has really struck me in my 20 years of, of getting to walk with people in the way that God's allowed me to walk with people is uh, the way that people process death. I've, I've been involved with over 100 funerals, which doesn't sound exciting to probably many of you, most of us don't look forward to something like that, and I, I, I don't either. Um, it's hard. One of the things that I've discovered is that it's always hard. Uh, I've seen people go um, and, and uh, when they've lost their, their great-grandmother and, and find a, a little bit of relief, you know, as great-grandmother has passed away, but you still end up looking at memories and you're like, oh, I've forgotten all about that. And that is a, it's something that, that hits you close to home. I, I've seen people as, as they've, they've lost their, their cousin or their dad, and, 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 and the pain that goes along with that, I've seen people lose their spouse or lose a kid. And those days are tough. But what I have discovered... And uh, if you have lost somebody close to you, you know that this is true. Uh, it's not normally the day that somebody passes away that's the hardest day. It's the day after and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that. It's the funeral and then the day after the funeral. When everybody else just goes on and the world seems to get started and back to normal and you're like, my day is it's, it's just not normal. This is not normal. There is something about death that, 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 that hits us in a way that it just doesn't feel like it should be this way. Right? We, we, we know that, look, the, the, the mortality rate in the world today is 100%. Right? We know that everybody is going to die. And yet there is something that says this is not the way that it's supposed to be. Right? There is something inside us that, that fights against that. And I've watched as people try to process. I've seen families have a hard time coming into the funeral home. I've seen other families build memorials on sides of roads and come and celebrate those things every year. Just trying to figure out how to process. Last week, Brandon shared with us the story of Jesus and his crucifixion. He shared with us uh, how Jesus went and, and didn't fight as, as he was lied about and tried and ultimately hung from a cross and died, right? And, and we, we, we saw the hardest day. Now, that was the hardest day for him. But I wonder if that was the hardest day. Today, we're going to look at the, the day as Jesus died, what happened the day after that and the day after that. We're going to see the, the people trying to process, what do we do now that he's not here? You see, right, for us, we know that Jesus comes back to life. If you've... Uh, grown up in the church, you've, you've heard. There, there's this, this thing that we talk about. Jesus is alive. But to the people in that moment, the people in that moment, this was not something that was reality for them. And so I want to ask you to, to, to join me in this. I want to ask you to try, and, to try and put yourself in the place that the disciples were at as Jesus passed away. Put yourself in the place where, where they were at, where they are just trying to process what life was going to look like from then Forward. We're going to be looking in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 42. Um, so if you guys will turn in your Bibles there, or if you don't have a Bible, there's some seat, Bibles in the seats in front of you, and we're going to be on page 853 um, in one of those Bibles in the seats in front of you. We're going to just look at the, the, the story of Jesus when Jesus has died, and what does that mean for the people? And then ask the what if that they were left with in that moment. What if Jesus is alive? Starting in verse 42 of Mark 15, we see this. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he had learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen cloth, shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. So here's the story. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a 
a member of the council, which means he was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the people that, that tried Jesus. They were the ones who uh, put on the, the court procession that Thursday night, Friday morning, uh, you know, 24 hours earlier, less than 24 hours earlier, they had um, tried Jesus and had decided Jesus needed to die. They were the ones who sent Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate ultimately had Jesus crucified. And now Joseph, who was a member of that group, Luke tells us uh, Joseph did not um, agree with their decision to crucify Jesus. And so he puts himself in danger by going and asking for Jesus' body. Now, why is he in danger? A couple things. One, Well, Pilate has just crucified Jesus as an insurrectionist. Pilate, who was the governor, has crucified Jesus. And so if Joseph goes and asks for the body, he is risking getting himself on the wrong side of the law. But that's not the real reason he is risking himself here. You guys ever feel peer pressure? Okay, let's go back to middle school when they talked about peer pressure all the time. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where like everybody's doing one thing and you're like want to do something else, but you don't do the something else because everybody else is doing the one thing. Or you, you don't say what needs to be said because you don't want to look like an idiot in front of all of your friends. And so you just kind of keep quiet from the pressure of it all, right? We've experienced that, right? This is, this is what happens. All of Joseph's closest relationships were people who were against Jesus, right? Or the majority of them were. And these people had decided Jesus needed to die, and Joseph did not agree. And so he decided to go and bury the body of Jesus. Now, if there was Twitter in uh, AD 33, this would have blown up all over Jewish Twitter, okay? Because Joseph is going against the, 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 the leaders of the party, and the leaders of the party would have been like, can you believe what Joseph's doing right now? It would have been a really, really big deal. But Joseph doesn't care. Why? Because Joseph knew something about God's Word, and Joseph, even though the rest of the society was going one direction, believed this. This is Deuteronomy 21. This is a command from God. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on that tree. You should remove, shall bury him and on the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God, and you shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. So Joseph did not want to see Jesus be cursed by God. He didn't want the curse to be on the land and on Jesus, and so he decided, I'm going to take Jesus down, I'm going to go and buy a cloth, I'm going to get some spices, I'm going to prepare him, and I'm going to bury him in my own tomb. On the way, we learned that from John that Nicodemus, who was another religious leader, met him, and the two of them prepared Jesus, and they buried him in, in the tomb. Now, again, I'm asking you to, to forget for a second that Jesus is alive. Joseph is using his own tomb to bury Jesus. Now, Jesus only borrowed it for a couple days, right? But Joseph didn't know that, right? That was not a reality for Joseph. For Joseph, Jesus was dead, and he was going to stay dead. And so he was giving himself up, risking himself and his perspective and his stuff for Jesus. Now, what he didn't realize at the moment was that he was fulfilling a 700-year-old prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 9 says this. And they made him a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So he died with the wicked. He died on the cross next to two uh, thieves or insurrectionists, and and he was buried in a rich man's tomb, although he had done nothing wrong. Joseph, without realizing it, fulfilled this promise from God. Now that's what Joseph did. At the same time, we see something else. Joseph just trying to to mourn for Jesus in the way that he knew. Verse 47 through uh, verse chapter 16, 5 tells us this. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were, were his, uh, saw where he was laid. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And and they were saying to each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. 
so it says this, and there's a couple things I want to notice about this. They, uh, these women who had been close followers of Jesus, they were people who trusted that Jesus was their Messiah. They had followed him around to the point where even after he died, they went to see where he was buried. They, they followed him around, and after he died, they, they, they followed him that way. And then on Sunday morning, they got up and they went to the tomb to try to prepare the body. One thing I want to notice about this, even though Jesus was dead, they, they did this because they love him. This is what we do. When we're mourning over somebody who has died, we do everything that we can to try to remember that person, right? We try to remember and we try to uh, hold on to things and we try to do that. And they were trying to do that for Jesus. And that's one thing to notice. But the second thing I think I, that I really want to notice, and I think this is the much more important lesson, is this. They were obedient to God's commands on the worst day. Okay. This is Sunday morning. Early Sunday morning, like as soon as the sun get, comes up, they, they buy some spices, they go to prepare Jesus' body. What day did Jesus die on? Starts with an F, ends with a right A. Died on Friday. There's a day between Friday and Sunday. Come on, guys. All right, this is the test. Everybody passes the test if they can say it with me. It was Monday, Saturday, sorry. It was Saturday, right? He died on Friday, then he was buried on Sunday. There's Saturday. Why didn't they go on Saturday? It was Sabbath day. Okay, they didn't go on the Sabbath day, which of course, right, they're good Jewish people, they didn't go on Saturday. Let's think this through. Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one that they believed to be the Messiah. He was the one that they believed to be the, the one who was going to deliver them, and now he is dead. He is the one that they believed that God had sent to deliver them from oppression and the brokenness of this world, and now he is dead. If there was ever a day to not care about the Sabbath, wouldn't it be that day? I mean, how many of us have known that God wanted us to do something, but we were disappointed with God, and so we decided, you know what, God? Not today. Just me? where we know the commands of God, but God has let us down. We know what God desires of us, but God has let us down. So not today. These ladies, imagine what this was like. These later, ladies saw Jesus die, they saw him buried, and they rushed home for the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is... Starts at the evening, and it goes till the evening. So they rushed home Friday night, and they did the Passover, and they sat in their house, and they waited. What was that waiting like? If you're like me, you just want to get up and go. The sitting and the waiting is the hardest part. And they sat and they waited, knowing that the body of Jesus is just decaying. They waited because that's what God had called them to do. And that's what Jesus would have done. So they waited. And when they got up, they start walking. And they don't even know what they're going to do. Uh, they don't even know how they're going to get the stone out of the way. They're talking about it to each other. And as they walk up, they see that the stone is already moved. And you can imagine what that was like. You start to shake a little bit. You start to wonder what's going on. Why is the stone moved? The stone wasn't moved when we saw him Friday night. Now the stone is moved. Is there something going on? Has somebody stolen the body? Has somebody done something to Jesus? And they walk in and they see this guy dressed in white sitting there next on, on the right side of the tomb. And this is what he says, verse 6 through 8. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in white. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he has gone before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And, and they went out and they fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they, were, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. I can't even imagine what this was like. Right? They walk into the tomb, and they see this man, and it's an angelic being. He's dressed in white. They, they, they know that he's an angel, and he says, Jesus isn't here. 
He's alive. He's not here. Go back and tell the, the disciples and Peter that Jesus has gone before them to Galilee. You just, you just go back. And, and it says this, the reaction is fascinating to me because I, 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 I could totally see it. They, they, they start to tremble, it says, and they're astonished and then they're afraid. Why were they astonished? Why were they afraid? Why were they trembling? Jesus is supposed to be dead. You guys know death is final? Right? Death, death, death is it. This is it. I know it sounds obvious, but it is. Jesus was supposed to be dead. And then he wasn't. And in that moment, as they're standing there, it says that they start to tremble. Why did they tremble? You know that feeling when your adrenaline drops? When like this, something has changed and you know what's going on and then you start to tremble because your adrenaline drops. You can't even control yourself. This is, this is where they are in that moment as they start to realize the implications. Like Jesus is not here. He's not here. And, and, and this, this, this angel's telling me that he's alive. And then they're astonished. Think about what that was like at the reality of the moment. Look, if you have grown up in church, you just hear this. Yeah, Jesus is alive and, and the sun comes up in the morning. This is the stuff. We take this for granted. In that moment... Something happened. And they were astonished. Then they were afraid. Because this just got real. This is bigger. This is bigger than anything that we understand. Bigger than anything that they could comprehend. Bigger than anything that they could have understood in that moment. And bigger than anything that we can understand right now. Because this is where the entire story changes. So what I want to do is spend the next few minutes thinking about what was going on in their minds as they were walking back home. Right? What was going through their minds as they walked back? What was going through the disciples' minds when they heard that Jesus was alive? What is this going? What does this mean? And I want to ask you to think through what this looked like for them because this is what it looked like. The first thing that they would have thought about is they got up and they started to walk back. Wait, it means that Jesus is still alive. Right? That that he's not dead. That he's not dead, that he is still alive, and that death is not one. Now, if, if he is still alive, okay. I had a realization of death last night. Um, I went to my 25th class reunion yesterday. Those people are old. <laughs> right? The last time I saw them, they were all 18 and full of vigor. And then I asked Bonnie, I asked my wife, I said, so tell me I didn't look old like them. And she said, you all looked the same, which was depressing. <laughs> I needed something different than that, my love, but it's okay. The realization, the reality is that we, look, this thing's falling apart, right? And some of you guys are looking at it and saying, you don't even know the half of it, Jim. We had people that we graduated high school with that have passed away. Death is something that we're constantly faced with it is chasing us and it is there and it's happening and it's wearing us all out but jesus is still alive and so when they realized that jesus is still alive that meant that something that was fundamental to the understanding of the universe changed in that moment because death at least in this instance was not final And if it's not, if death is not final, it means this. It means the promises of Jesus are true. Jesus had told his disciples, I am going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to come back to life. And the first time he said that to his disciples, Peter went to Jesus and said, not going to do it, I'm not going to let that happen, that's not what's going to happen to you. He basically tried to tell God, no, you won't. Which is what we do too, by the way. Because the disciples did not want Jesus to die. But Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life. He also promised some other things. He promised that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Anyone. How many people does anyone cover? anyone the promise of god through jesus christ is that anyone who would believe in him would not perish perish is another word for 
die forever, but have everlasting life. That promise becomes true because Jesus is alive. How can he promise that people could not die forever but have everlasting life? Because Jesus didn't die forever. And then he said this. He also made another promise. He said, I am going to go and prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come back again to to bring you to be with you. Bring you to be with me where I am, that where I am, that you may be also. That Jesus is going to go and he's going to bring us to be with him, that we can be with him forever. Like, that's a promise of God that is made, yes, because Jesus is alive. You know what else it means that Jesus is alive? It means that God is actively invested in what's going on right now. How do I know? Because Jesus came back to life, and God had to do that. Like, I can't do that. You can't do that. None of us can die and say, I'm going to come back to life in a couple days. All of us would be like, you're a weirdo. Jesus did exactly that, and it was by the power of God, which means that God is actively working. He is actively here, and with that, we have to have an understanding of something. If Jesus is alive, It proves the truth of Scripture. Let me just talk for a minute about what happened with the disciples after this. Uh, The disciples, they heard that Jesus was alive, and then they saw him alive. And from that point forward, these women, the men, after this, from that point forward, spent the rest of their lives saying, I don't care what you do to me. I saw him dead, and now he's alive. And it doesn't matter if you want to hurt me or kill me, he's still alive. Now, if they were lying, some people will lie to cover up their own stuff, right? And they'll suffer to their death for their own lives. But the disciples and these women, from this point forward, said, I don't care what you do to me, I also don't care what you do to my family. How many of you would be willing to watch your family suffer for something you knew, that you knew was a lie? Anyone? Right, as you watched your own family suffering and abused and beaten over something you knew you'd lied to them about, wouldn't you just say, hey, I'm sorry, I got a little out of hand, please don't hurt my family. Right? Listen, I, 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 this, this, this is what, for me, personally, proves the existence of God. These men and these women, from this point forward, said, I don't care what you do to me, And I don't care what you do to my family. Jesus is alive. He was dead and he is alive. And if you want to kill us, that's fine because we're going to go be with him. I saw him alive and we're going. I saw Jesus alive and he said, and that's why Paul says, look, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's why when they go to Paul and they said, you better stop that or we're going to kill you. He's like, sweet. And they're like, fine, well, we'll let you live. Okay. Okay. Right? This is the thing. Because Jesus is alive, these people were like freaks. Why do I say they're freaks? Because all of us are scared of dying. Except for them. They knew that God was working and real because of the resurrection. And the reason I know today Jesus is alive is because those people were willing to watch their own family members die not because they were cold and heartless, but because they knew that this was a greater truth than anything this world could give them. Jesus is alive. And because of that, it means that Jesus is coming back. It means that Jesus is coming back. You see, because he promised, I'm going to go and then I'm going to return and you will see me return in the same way that I have left. He is going to descend from the clouds. He is going to come back and he is going to make right what is wrong. On the day that Jesus came back to life, the, the, the curse that is over all of the creation was numbered. That day stopped the curse from being permanent. The Bible actually tells us in Romans 8 that the whole creation, like the earth, is groaning because of sin. All of us can look around and see everything is broken. Everything is broken, but it's not going to stay broken because Jesus is coming back to make it 
permanently right. This is what the resurrection proved. It proved that what is broken will be fixed, and what God has done, he is going to do. He is going to make this right. And that is why we rejoice, because Jesus is alive. And that is the stuff that the disciples were thinking and having to process as they found out on that Sunday something happened. Something that changed the universe. So here is my bottom line for you guys today. The thing to to take with you as you realize that Jesus is alive, by his wounds we are healed. By the wounds of Jesus, by the things that he suffered, we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And because of that, you don't have to find healing in anything other than Jesus. You're not going to find healing in TikTok and the 10-second dopamine drops because as soon as you turn it off, it's like it all goes away and the same need pops back up. You're not going to find healing on your phone or on your TV. You're not going to find healing in the arms of somebody who's not your spouse. You're not going to find healing in a bottle. You're not going to find healing anywhere other than Jesus. And we try We try, man. We try and we try and we try because we want to make it fixed and we want to make it right because it still hurts. But Jesus, because he is alive, proves that it doesn't have to hurt forever. You may have been in a place where because of your decisions that you've made, you're looking at your life now and saying, I've already sinned too much. I've fallen too far. I've made too many bad decisions. This is too much. I know that Jesus is alive, but he wouldn't want me. He told these women to go and tell the disciples and Peter that he was going to be there in Galilee. Why do you think the and Peter is there? Why not just the disciples? Because the last thing Peter had done was deny Jesus three times. Now, you may have messed up, but you weren't like a close personal friend of Jesus. And the last time you saw him, you said, no, I don't even know who that guy is. If any of you have been betrayed, you know how that feels. And Jesus' first words about Peter are, go tell him I still want him. So if you have found yourself in a place where the sin has stacked on you and you're like, I, I want to believe that Jesus is alive, but I don't think that I am worthy to accept that I have made decisions that make me unlovable by God, that's a lie. Here's the lie. And this is how we need to live as we own it. We need to live like Jesus is alive because the lie that the, the devil and his dark forces are trying to get, to believe, get us to believe is that this world is pointless and that we have no hope. That everything is a waste of time. So you may as well just start wasting time. But we have the knowledge that there was this time when this guy died and he came back to life. He said it was going to happen, and then it did. Which means that God is actively invested in our lives and in human history, and he is actively invested in us. He has, if you've got this message today, he chose to give it to you so that you could show it to other people. How would you live differently if you knew for a fact that Jesus was alive? It made the disciples no longer afraid to die. It made the disciples care about people that they normally wouldn't care about. We can be those people. People who show the world that there's hope instead of just brokenness. People who show the world that there's something different. So that's the last thing I want you guys to do this week. Let's just think about it. Let's go and tell people. Go tell people... Go tell people Jesus is alive. Now, to, to the point, they're going to be like, well, why does that even matter? And then you get to tell them what I just told you. Like, I just, just basically preach the sermon to them again. Easy enough, right? Just, just go do it. No, just go tell people Jesus is alive, which means God cares about us, which means there's a God out there. So let's just start to think about, well, what if God's out there? 
What if he actually cares about you? What if God cares about you? Because if he does, it means you matter. It's time to live like you matter. We're going to pray here in just a second. We're going to take communion, and Tim's going to come up, and he's going to sing. Um, but if today is the day that you're ready to just say, I want Jesus to be my salvation. I want to follow him for the rest of my life, wherever he's got me to go. And you've never confessed Jesus as Savior, let today be that day. I'll be in the back if you want to share that with me. We've actually got warm water in the baptistry here. We're going to have a young man baptized here in a few moments. He doesn't have to be the only one. What if today is the day for you to say, I want Jesus to be my direction? Take the picture of dying to yourself and starting new as your picture. I'm going to pray, and we're going to see what God does. Almighty God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for bringing him back to life and for the hope that we have in that. When everything else starts to feel hopeless, God, I thank you for reminding me of that, and I pray that you would do the same with this church. That instead of being, being darkened by the hopelessness of this world, we would be enlightened by the light of life that comes because Jesus is alive. Please, God, shine hope into our hearts today. Let us let go of our own things that we try to find glory in. Let us find hope in Jesus. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.